Land Conquest. All right. Well, super excited for today's conversation. Today we have on John Burks and Jeshua Livstrom. And uh, I met both of these guys doing a recent partner with Pete Deal. They're land investors as well. So we did a partner deal together that turned out really well. So I asked them if they would kind of come on and, and let me uh, have a little conversation with them, talk about uh, their background in land investing and, and what they're doing with their business. And also we'll talk about the deal that we did together and kind of break down the numbers of that and everything. So so welcome, uh, John and Jeshua. And uh, maybe a great place to start would be if you guys could just, uh, since you guys kind of work as partners in this business, maybe if you could go into that a little bit and kind of let us know a little bit about your business. So I don't know which you guys wants to start. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to navigate the back and forth. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Well, I think uh, originally we started uh, looking at investing in houses, ironically. And we, you know, traveled down that uh rabbit hole for a little bit and Josh uh, and I were just looking for a better way to get into the business you know we were newbies and uh, that just wasn't you know working out uh, Josh had a history of uh, you know doing a lot of research on mobile homes I was looking uh, into uh, Airbnbs uh, lease options that kind of thing but what we were trying to do is find something that was a little bit off the beaten path, but, uh, you know, had a great future in it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. A lot of people, it seems like, start down that road, you know, like that's the most common path that a lot of people take is because there's all that, you know, there's all these shows on HGTV and everything about people flipping homes. And, you know, that's that's what a lot of people gravitate towards until... Until they realize uh, the logistics involved with that business, it's it's tough and it's ultra ultra competitive as well. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's tough. And a lot of people get in. They're like, "How do I even get a deal?" <laughs> you know. So, uh, so so that's interesting. Did you do? Did you guys end up doing any flips or wholesales on, on, with houses, or did you just kind of like uh, realize that like, hey, this was this wasn't the path that I wanted to go on, and you know, somehow decide to f switch to land we we got close we we sent out some mail and we lost a little edm on uh on kind of a portfolio package in west virginia it was a great learning experience though and learned about land pretty shortly thereafter and you know, you know the land business is very much a, a paperwork business and a computer business and that appealed to us uh especially if they're Experience in houses. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you like you don't um, you don't need to deal with tenants or you know <laughs> you know the homeowners or coordinating them moving out or any of that the, the kind of stuff or contractors repairs anything like that, which is which is kind of nice. So you guys are both in Minnesota, uh, so you know I, I assume you're like most land investors where you're doing kind of everything virtually and sort of buying all over the country huh yeah that's that's exactly right and uh going back to what you said about contractors that's what scared us away from the the residential deal that we were looking at uh when we started figuring out how we would have to manage these contractors from afar it just seemed like too much but uh so far we've been really spraying mail all across the u.s i know a lot of um trainers advise that you kind of start in your backyard or focus on a couple of markets. But our approach has been for the most part to target a lot of different markets at the same time so that we can get experience in different markets and figure out what we like. And I think we've learned a lot by uh, just, you know, we've tried everything from the coast where they have a lot of wetlands to, uh, you know, to Texas, to to Indiana and, and every state in between. Mm -hmm. Has there been any particular area that's kind of like resonated with you so far? Like that you were like, oh, I can see like doing a lot more deals here. Well, certainly in Texas, just because of how much opportunity is available there, just how much land is available there. Uh, but we've tried to take a more data centric approach. And we started in we started in North Carolina and Georgia. And I think we had a similar experience to you, Pete. This was almost just about a year ago now 
Well, we targeted the, you know, the most competitive markets and, uh, you know, gave them really low ball offers and the response rate was really bad. And, uh, you know, the responses that we did get were pure wetlands. And at the time we weren't using land ID, we were using a different mapping service that didn't have a very good way of detecting wetlands. So we were, I think, uh, pissing a lot, off a lot of agents uh, by sending them deals that were, you know, 100% wetlands and we didn't even realize that. But to get back to your original question, uh, when we started, a real turning point for us was to target markets with like a strong variability coefficient. So finding markets that have comps that were really similar to each other. And that's been really helpful. Uh, so that keeps us away from wetlands, keeps us away from more mountainous areas. Uh, we've done a little work with like AI and BARD and, uh, you know, uh, chat GTP to try to, you know, steer us away from those counties that will be problematic from, you know, the wetlands and, and, and slow perspective. But the next turning point after that was, okay, I was focused on the variability coefficient and you helped us along the way here. Uh, I wasn't targeting counties. We weren't targeting counties with um, enough enough sales like something might have a really strong variability coefficient but if there's not enough enough uh, sold comps then you can't even trust that variability coefficient i like that i like that variability coefficient that's a that's a pretty interesting way to look at it you know because because what we do i mean we're um i assume you're doing all blind offers like i am you know like we're sending out you know we're pricing uh our offers based off of averages for a particular county and when you've got a county or, or an area that's kind of all over the place, you know, maybe it's got some coastal or waterfront type stuff. And then it's got some other stuff, which is, you know, very rural and the pricing is going to be so different. And it's hard to, it's hard to make that, that work in those areas. But so you're, you're only targeting the counties where everything's like really kind of consistent, huh? Exactly. We're trying to, and you know, we, you know, when we have the data and, you know, the data is good enough, we'll, we'll resend uh, to a county, even though, you know, it doesn't meet our, our criteria going forward, just because we've already paid for the data. But that's, that's the type of data that we're trying to gather going forward. Hmm, that's interesting. Do you ever split up like a county into different sections based off of, you know, maybe the variability in that, in that particular county? Haven't yet. Uh, we'd like to get more sophisticated. We'd like to get a lot more sophisticated in terms of our data analysis, but haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. So do you guys, um, do you guys kind of break down the roles you, you, you do a lot, you know, together as a partnership? Do you, do you guys sort of break down the roles? It's like, Hey, Jeshua, this is, this is your job. John, this is your job. And like, how do you break up the, the work uh, with you guys? Well, I guess I can answer. Uh, Jesh uh, does a lot of the data analysis uh, and reviewing of things. I think he is brilliant at uh, organizing things and keeping us on track. Uh, you know, when it comes to looking at the big picture, uh, I do a lot of the uh, operational day-to-day -day, uh, management of like our team. And the rest of our team, our VAs, uh, we had multiple uh, for a while. Uh, but that's kind of how we split up duties. We always, uh, you know, meet several times a week to discuss uh, whether there's viability in a deal uh, or, or if we want to, uh, you know, pass on a deal or move forward or be more aggressive here or there. Uh, but uh, we're, we're both very involved in pretty much all the processes. Yeah. And then, you know, when we have those discussions and we're not sure what to do with the deal, we just say, send it to Pete. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. He figured it out. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's actually, that, that's one of the great uh, value that you've been providing. And I want everybody to hear this. Like um, you've, you've turned down uh, a number of deals that we've sent to you, but you haven't just turned them down blindly. You've always provided good feedback and explained exactly why it doesn't work for you. And that's been really helpful for us. Uh, so I appreciate it. And just uh, adding to what John said, uh, John's a full-time entrepreneur has been for uh, probably the better part of the, a decade. Uh, I've been on the W2 track and I, I still have a W2 job. So uh, for me, it, made a lot of sense to, to have a partner 
I was able to bring some capital uh, to the table and, um, you know, I can do those tasks that, you know, that don't, you know, that, that don't require me to be present from eight to four. I could work weekends and and evenings and maybe even uh, sneak a call in during the lunch break. Um, But that's, that's why it's been a really good partnership. An interesting fact about John and I, we actually had our, we've been in some form of business together really since the ninth grade. We had a, we had a little, little business together in the ninth grade uh, and even got a contract with our school. We got to put together some desktop aquaponics kits for the school. We were trying to breed fish and they used them as, as raffle pri- uh, prizes at a end of year banquet. So we've uh, dabbled in a few hustles since then, but um, it was a partnership that made sense. And it's nice to, you know, this, this is a business that works. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. You know what? It's funny. Um, some people are just, they're just entrepreneurs, you know, they're always kind of thinking about that and everything. And it's, it's funny. You guys were even thinking along those lines at an early age. <laughs> so ninth grade, that's great. Now, would you say that this is a better business than that business? And then desktop aquaponics goes, yes, way more scalable and, and not as many dead, dead fish. And um, to add a little more color to our story, we actually had uh, another classmate uh, abscond with a bunch of our fish. They just uh, they stole all of our fish and moved. We couldn't believe it. It was a it was a hard lesson to learn early on. Early life lesson. Well, you know, you you learn about bringing on the wrong partner, right? Like, it's funny. You hear that in uh, you hear that in business a lot. People, you know, their partner stole from them or whatever, and you guys learned it early that like, hey, at least you lost some fish and not not some real money, right? <laughs> so. That's, that's funny. And so what, what made you start, um, what made you pay attention to land? Like what, how did you guys, you know, like how'd you guys go down the land rabbit hole? Yeah. So I think as John mentioned, I mean, we were looking at everything, Airbnbs, mobile home parks, everything, you know, paid for a little education. And, uh, I I think I actually heard, I, I think I heard about land first on a, uh, on the old dogs network REI podcast. And that would have been probably a year before I actually looked into any training, but I, uh, we, we bought the Argy tipster course and, uh, then we bought land Academy and that, you know, we probably got Argy tipster in fall of 2022, got land Academy probably at the beginning of 2023. And that, that got us off the ground, uh, you know, when we were doing RE Tipster, we were doing tax lists and that made sense from a cost perspective, but it was tough to scale and just a real pain to uh, interact with the counties and, and track down all, all these lists and then organize the data thereafter. But Land Academy got us off, off to a good start. Um, and then you probably came in spring of 2023 when you started teasing everybody about the, the program that you came out with, which... Uh, didn't disappoint. And I think the real value that you provided, I mean, was several fold, but uh, first you provided those income reports, which I think, uh, I I think brought some definition uh, to the land business that wasn't there before from previous courses that we had taken. And in some ways it was sobering. The the income reports were, uh, were inspiring and showed what you can accomplish. But it, it helped us to understand how much mail we actually have to send to make the business work and to actually scale it. And I think uh, previously, I think we were being, uh, you know, I think, I, I think we had it in our heads that, you know, we could send a few thousand mailers and, you know, price them at 20% and, you know, get rich. And, uh, it, it, you know, you know, the, the value that you brought even before you opened your training program was just, uh, that transparency and showing those income reports and, and saying, Hey, you actually got to send a lot of mail to, to get a lot of deals. And that was really helpful. Uh, and while, while I'm at it, while I'm at it, uh, you know, for, for me, the other, the other parts of your training program that were really helpful, uh, you know, there's some templates that we still use. We use your purchase agreement template and your, your mailing template, the due diligence checklist, um, the droner scripts. Uh, but, you know, 
somewhere in module four or five, you specifically say how to price the mailers. And I hadn't seen that anywhere else before. And it's, it's you know, a matrix that you provide based on sold to for sale ratios and, uh, you know, percentages based off of that. And that was, that provided me with a lot of clarity and I think has really helped our response rate. Yeah, that's great. Well, that's awesome to hear. Yeah, that's uh, that's I'm 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 really thankful that you uh, you guys have actually looked at those and read those income reports. We spend a lot of time on them, and not just me. Like I've got other team members that kind of help me compile all the data and get everything together. So it's kind of like a it's kind of like a big chore every month. So I'm glad that you guys actually uh, liked looking at those and everything. And that was my idea, you know. Like hopefully, you know, it other people will see kind of what. Uh, what can be done. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm doing more than anyone else or anything like that, but, but I do think that it's, uh, it's at a level that maybe some people want to strive towards. So, I, you know, so it's, it's good to hear that you guys actually enjoy those. <laughs> so keeping them up, even though it's a lot of work. <laughs> so, well, we, we appreciate uh, it. And yeah, it's, it's really helpful just to have that transparency, you know, uh, I don't see that transparency anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's one of my kind of like core values is the like transparency because uh, it is what it is. That's kind of the way I think about it. You know, like I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything or, or anything like that. It's just a matter of putting it out there. And if it resonates with people, helps anyone, that's great. And obviously it brings, you know, one of the big things is it brings attention to my, you know, partner with Pete program and it brings attention to our mentorship programs and stuff like that. And that's kind of the whole concept by behind like giving away the training program for free and, and also, you know, like, um, you know, to just being able to, to do partnership deals with a lot of different, you know, investors out there, deals that I would never have access to, or I would never probably even met you guys, you know, if it wasn't for me putting out that, that content and stuff. So it's, it's kind of, kind of, um, it's kind of fun for me for my end. It's uh, I think it's it's a good win-win relationship in a lot of cases. So, um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, so where do you guys see this business going? Like, what are the goals? What what uh, what, what do you want to accomplish with it? Well, to add on to what Josh was saying, uh, uh, I want to say thanks uh, for a lot of the responses you gave uh, on the deals you turned down because. Uh, the explanations helped me see some of the holes in our process and uh, the way we were evaluating deals uh, before. For instance, uh, just, you know, missing fine things. And then, uh, like, uh, you know, getting that agent uh, out there with boots on the ground. Uh, and then uh, how we were interacting with uh, title companies. Uh, so I'm very thankful uh, as well. well. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. I, you know, I absolutely hate, I hate, hate, hate turning down deals. Uh, I feel bad, you know, like if, if a deal, you know, if I don't see it the, the same way, you know, as the investor that submits a deal sees it, you know, I, I feel bad giving, giving that, uh, you know, that news that I can't fund the deal or whatever, but you know, uh, the consolation is I try to explain why, you know, like what my thinking is and everything like that. And one of the things that's been worked really well for me is that it ha I have to feel really like I have to, has to really make sense for me. And, and I'm wrong sometimes, you know, so I've passed up on some deals before and some of the investors have come back and said, Oh, you passed on this one. And we ended up selling it and making all this money. And I'm like, Oh, great. I'm glad for you. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I just, it wasn't feeling it. it. I saw something about it that I wasn't sure about. And, you know, I got to, got to <laughs> kind of go with what I'm seeing. So I will, uh, I will say that we have, so. we have a very clear objective. So our goal is to operationalize four deals a month. And, you know, after, after we get to that, uh, after we achieve that goal, then we'll reassess, but that, that's a very clear goal. I'd be happy to share some of our, our stats over the last year, kind of in the, the spirit of transparency and, I know some of the other guests on, on your show have shared that as well. Oh, yeah, that would, that would uh, be awesome. In 2023, we sent 123,000 mail pieces. Uh, we average one deal per 7,200 mail pieces. Although I think it's going to be a little better than that because I think there's still a couple deals coming, you know, from mail that, that we, we sent. Uh, 
so far we've dispoed nine deals. Uh, our total revenue was 522,000. Uh, we self-funded six of them and we got uh, three of them funded uh, by others, um, including Pete. We had a gra average gross profit margin of 30,000 and 45. Uh, our average buy price for those dispo de deals is 29,000. Our average sell price was 72,000. Uh, we currently have two deals in inventory and kind of at about the same range uh, of the dispo deals. And then right now we have six more in escrow. And uh, for those, we have an average purchase price of 37,000 and our projected average sales price, you know, from experience, the projected sales price tends to be a little higher than the actual sales price, but our projected sales price is an average of 82,000 for those. And uh, we think we'll be able to do double our revenue with these these six deals that we have in, in escrow right now. Uh, but you can see like we're kind of trending, we're trying to target higher deals. And uh, I think that's reflected, uh, you know, in, in these six that we have in escrow right now. And then, you know, again, hopefully we'll get a couple more from from the, from the mail that went out in 2023 as well. Yeah. You know, that's that's really interesting because those numbers are very similar to like our averages and stuff as well. Like your uh, cost per, per deal in mail um, sounds like, uh, you know, I was just doing rough calculations in my head as you were going. I, I, it cost me about thirty five hundred dollars per deal, you know. Um, and then you did you're you're at about thirty thousand dollars like average gross profit per deal right around there that's exactly what i averaged last year um so that that's funny um so when you think about it that way it's like yes uh that sounds like a lot of money to spend for a deal but when you're spending thirty five hundred or so for to get each deal and you're making thirty thousand dollars in profit i mean that's that's pretty much a no brainer that someone said, well, if you put $3,500 in the slot machine and 30,000 will come out, like who wouldn't do it? Right. <laughs> so Exactly. And I think it uh, goes back to, to scale as well. I mean, if, if, if you're sending out 10,000 mail pieces, who knows what you're going to get back. But if you send out 30,000 mail pieces, you know, you're going to get five deals out of it or, or something to that effect. Yeah. That's uh that's really incredible. So, uh, so you've got six deals, uh, under contract that you're purchasing right now and you've sold nine already, right? That's yep. Great. Yep. And we have two more in inventory. Okay. And two more in inventory. Actually, we have a, we have a good story about one of these in inventory and it's uh, we have a little bit of, of egg on our face for it, but I think we'd be happy to like, share with the spirit of going forward and maybe I'll introduce it, but, but John can, can fill in the holes because he's been he has been uh, really incredible through this. We 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 bought a pro we bought a um, we bought a parcel. It was a beautiful parcel. It was on a river, and uh, we bought it for fifty thousand. We had an agent tell us that we could probably sell it for about one fifty. Uh, we had it. You know, we had it on the market for a couple months and we kept getting sellers that were or buyers that were interested in buying it. But they, uh, you know, nobody really bit. And then finally we got it under contract for 100000 So a little less than we were planning on making. But, you know, we were still happy with that and just happy to, to sell it. When it went through title on the sell side, uh, the title company said that it did not have legal access. And basically, as part of the deed, there was something called a, a, a partial limitation of access. And when we had read that, we thought that meant that it was partial. And we, we thought there was clear access. Uh, anyways, the title company wouldn't insure it for access. Uh, deal kind of broke down on the, on, the, on, on the sales side. And you know, of course, we were kind of scared. Uh, over the last month, John has contacted everybody and their little brother, including the state department, you know, the, the state transportation department, the, the, the county. Uh, he's dug up all sorts of old documents and appraisals, done all sorts of research, um, called everybody and their little brother. He finally ran into this surveyor who 
uh, is really kind of a guardian angel for us. And I uh, got the surveyor to do some lobbying on behalf of us to the Department of Transportation. And it was today, earlier today, actually, we got written confirmation from the Department of Transportation that there is legal access. So it's been quite a uh, quite an undertaking, especially on John's part. Um, but some lessons learned too. There was actually an exclusion in our title policy that I saw, but I didn't really understand, and you know, didn't take the time to to you know ask the right questions at the, at the right time. So I think we're in good shape now, and and we're talking through you know how to re you know uh, reopen the conversation with the interested sellers before. But yeah, John, what did I miss? You've been this is really your story. I think you did a really good job of uh, touching all the important points in a concise way. Uh, it was, you know, it was a struggle, but I, I think uh, I just had an inclination, almost like uh, an intuition, uh, by reading, you know, this, uh, the deed and the title policy. It was clear to me from the very beginning uh, that there should be access here based on the language. And I think the language is what was causing a lot of the friction, uh, you know, with the other entities, the title company, uh, you know, the state uh, transportation department, etc. Uh, the uh, buyers uh, title company is who actually brought it to our attention. And so they had an issue with the language as well. And we just couldn't find anyone to give us clarity. And so that was my reasoning for contacting, you know, anyone who would just clear it up. Because, again, uh, there was an inclination just based on the language, as Jess mentioned, uh, that there should be access here. And uh, above that, uh, there is a trust uh, I built, uh, you know, I had from the seller uh, through the rapport we built over the duration of the negotiation for the property. And, uh, you know, she had no reason to lie about what she was, you know, had told us. And uh, we had that documented in our notes. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to find someone with the authority to, you know, confirm, you know, that there was access. And so, and plus, I mean, we had a lot of money tied into this thing and, uh, you know, a learning, you know, experience that, you know, either way we were going to walk away more knowledgeable was my approach. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. So your persistence, uh, paid off and, you know, turned something that was a potential loser into something that's now is going to make you money. So. Totally. I, I told him to write it off like a month ago. Like, let's just let's just forget about it and move forward. And maybe we'll maybe we'll we'll go fish there one day. Uh, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. And he just he he pestered everybody. It was really incredible. That's great. I love persistence because uh, so many things people drop so many things sometimes, you know, before the finish line, you know, and with some persistence, uh, you can accomplish some some big things. So uh, it's really cool. Really cool to hear about that. I mean, heck, all these areas, there, there's a lot of different moving pieces with all these properties. And, you know, there's just a lot of things to pay attention to. That's why we put so much effort into our due diligence process, just because we've uncovered, you know, similar things like to that over time, you know, things you wouldn't even think of, you know, and you just got to you just got to keep digging into all these different things and um, try to avoid, you know, those red flags, as we call them. So. Um, but, uh, but that's great. And, and you, you basically increase the value of the property just by, you know, making all your calls and doing all that stuff. So that's really cool to hear. Uh, um, well, um, if you guys don't mind, I'll, I'll share the, um, numbers of the deal that we did together. Um, now this is a property. It was in Texas and, uh, I'm looking on my screen here. I'm not, uh, don't want to make it seem like I'm looking away, but, um, this property was about, it was about 17 acres and bought the purchase price on it. Um, it was initially a little bit higher. And then I believe there was a, we had to go back to the seller to renegotiate a little bit, which I hate doing that as well. Um, but John, was that you that did that, that part, uh, as, as well? 
<laughs> yeah. So you came through, uh, and I think they definitely at first they said no, no, we're not going to do it right, and then like they kind of they kind of canceled, it. and then they came back. What was that? Maybe like a week or two later, and said, "Okay, we'll do it." Is that how it worked? If my memory serves me, yeah, I think uh, originally we had it, uh, you know, up for fifty grand uh, is what our offer price was, and uh, we sent it to you, and you uh, responded back with uh, a lower offer that made much more sense, you know, after you know, time served, but. Uh, Initially, the seller, you know, you know, had his mind set on the 50 grand. And so when, you know, we sent the counter offer, uh, you know, he was just, you know, he was pretty upset. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it, you, you got it done. And uh, yeah, so we ended up um, with the closing costs and everything on the buy side, I think it ended up being forty one thousand seven hundred forty dollars and forty seven cents. And then we listed it. Um, I don't remember what the list price was maybe like one Oh four nine or something like that. If my memory serves me and it wasn't listed that long, uh, two, three weeks, something like that, I'm guessing. Um, and then we got a, um, uh, an offer in, and then I think we negotiated it to 95,000 as a sale price, which, you know, um, my goal is to always kind of double our money on these deals or whatever. Um, by the time you have closing costs and commissions and all that kind of stuff. So, so, uh, we got really close on this deal. Like, um, after everything was all said and done, there was, um, just over $38,000 profit, so which left us a profit of 19,276 for, for each side, which I thought was, uh, pretty good win-win deal. So, um, this was a, this was kind of a, uh, a very rural spot in Texas. So there wasn't a lot of comps to work by. So we kind of had to rely on the broker opinion there and stuff. And, you know, that ended up, ended up working out great. And, uh, I, I had never sold a property in that area. And I don't know if you guys have had or not, but, um, ended up working out pretty good. So 19,000 for each side, that's pretty good, pretty good day. So it worked well and you handled all the, you got the BPO and did the due diligence and uh, the transaction coordination and, and all of that. We just kind of said it and forgot about it till we got the check in the mail. Yeah, that's nice. That's the way I, that's what I like to hear too. You know, I, I got a pretty big uh, team build out and everyone's pretty specialized in what they do. So we've got a pretty uh, dialed in due diligence process and transaction process and all that stuff. So when I, when I was thinking about this partner with Pete program, I'm like, yeah, I want it to be different than, you know, some of the other deal funders out there. And I was like, well, what, what can I, what can I do that's different? And I was like, well, we can kind of handle all that stuff that that kind of bogs other investors down, you know, like we can handle all that stuff, just plug it into our kind of team's processes. And, uh, and then, you know, you guys can just focus on getting more deals, which is ultimately what's going to make the money, you know? So, so it's good to hear that it worked well from, from your perspective as well. Um, so, so, uh, are you guys, um, like thinking about, like, are you trying to focus in that same range, you know, like buy for 30,000, sell for 80, 90,000, that range, or are you thinking about stepping up to bigger deals or lot splits or anything like that in the future? I think we definitely like to do lot splits eventually. Uh, you know, we've already... You know, we, we've had the conversation several times and uh, when the opportunity presents itself, so especially if it's in the state with the planning exception, I think we go for it and, you know, probably try to partner with somebody that can walk us through it, at least for our first time. Uh, you know, generally speaking, I think we're trying to push, you know, you know, it's what everybody says. It's, it's just as easy to do a, you know, a higher spread deal as it is to do a lower spread deal. And I almost groan, like if we get like, okay, buy for 10, sell for 20. And it's like, ah, what do we, what do we do? Like, is this even worth our time? So I think we're going to keep trying to push upwards. Uh, maybe a question for you, if you can give us some free coaching, do you, do you, you know, we, we, we got here, this is what we did. So historically we've always used priced to uh, pull our data and kind of on a tip, we just kind of thought to that we'd do prop stream, which, uh, you know, for a couple of different reasons, but uh, we got this big data set from prop stream. 
Uh, and the data seems fine. The only problem is it has, you know, it has, uh, you know, once we once we went through and priced it, uh, you know, it has million dollar properties and it has, you know, five thousand dollar properties. And we're cutting out the, that lower echelon. But we're trying to figure out what to do with these, you know, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar properties and million dollar properties. And we're wondering, should we even make offers on them? If we do make offers on them, do we offer, you know, seventy five percent? Do we offer fifty percent? Uh, we're not really sure what to do with that. We we do want to target those properties, but we're it's a little bit of a mystery. We're, we're kind of going in blind in terms of like what the protocol should be. Yeah, I would say keep them in there, keep them in there, and then when you get them under contract, submit them to me. So those those, uh, especially if they're if they're good candidates for lot splits, you know those are those are great properties. Um, you know, it kind of depends. I would, I would offer, first of all, I would offer the, you know, the 50%, you know, I, I would, I would offer right around there because, you know, maybe there are some deal funders out there that will fund 70% of the, the value or whatever, but those are generally riskier type properties and things. And it's harder to kind of nail down the value in some of the, the some of those larger ones as well. So I would definitely be offering the 50%. I would keep them in there. Um, I had I had a, another deal partner that we closed a, a deal with um, in the fall, and it was a fifteen hundred acre property, and um, we bought the property for four hundred fifty thousand, and we sold it for nine seventy nine. So it was only on the market for like a week. So, uh, so yeah, there was a lot of money to be made um, for both of us for for a partner and for us, I mean, it, it, it was, you know, a, a really good deal. So yeah, I would, I would keep those ones in there. Obviously there's a lot less of those like larger properties around. Um, so it's not like a huge amount of those, um, you know, generally in your list. But, um, I also did one time I, I did a 650 acre property, you know, and it's, uh, you'll, you'll come across them here and there and you know, th those are the good ones. So, yeah. So, you know, the, the thing that, and I, and I get people submitting properties like that sometimes, you know, where they'll be like, okay, we can buy this one for 700,000 and sell it for a million. Well, while that may be the case. And while there may be, you know, a couple, two, three hundred thousand dollars worth of profit in there. Um, the problem is that you got to put out 700,000, you know what I mean? Which is not like, it's not like in the house, it's not like buying a house for 700,000 and selling it for a million because with the house, you can pretty much borrow the whole thing you know, or pretty close to it and use that much leverage. You can't use that much leverage on land, you know, like I, I have some, you know, I, I could probably get some of it um, finance for me or a good chunk of it a finance for me, but it's going to be at a high rate and it's going to be a lot riskier and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so I think that's what you're going to run into there. There may be, you know, like maybe there are some sort of um, fund or something out there that would be fine with that kind of spread. But um fewer and far between, you know, those, those ones, uh, they seem to be, you know, not, um, not playing in that, that category, you know, they like the 50 to a hundred thousand dollar purchases and stuff instead. Yeah. Let me know if you find that fund. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Maybe there's someone out there, but you know, I don't know. So I'd like to start up a fund actually kind of pool investor money and go after like very large properties and, and, you know, and with, with the idea that we're taking like a, a slimmer, you know, profit margin on those, but, you know, for, for some people that they may be fine with that, you know, as long as, you know, buying for 700 and selling for a million, and there's still a lot of profit, you know, but, you know, it's kind of, kind of a little different than what we, we do generally, you know, so lots of opportunity in this space. So, um, I was, uh, I was going to do a podcast episode about this, but I was just, I was, you know, been kind of going down the rabbit hole of the AI stuff and how AI is going to kind of change the, you know, change the economy and everything like that. And Sam Altman, the guy that's the CEO of open AI, he wrote a, uh, blog post in 2000, 2021, but talking about things in the future, basically, you know, and in the future, he's talking like 20 years down the road, he's talking about like the things that are going to have the the value are going to be companies, you know, 
businesses that focus a lot of their stuff on, on AI related things, whether it's services or, or just, just knowledge based things, but also land. He, he felt like that was the other category that is going to be, you know, just retain value cannot be, cannot be disrupted with AI. That's interesting. You know? yeah, not, there are any more of it, I suppose. I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. It's a blog code. Uh, it's a blog post that he did. You can probably just Google it. it says it's called Moore's law of everything. I think is what it's called. Well, and I've heard you refer to this a few times, I think just kind of, on the edges, but I mean, you know, in order to transform our, you know, our, uh, I guess our energy economy, uh, you know, into the sustainable space, I mean, we're going to need the land use. So I, I don't know what it is, but like one fifth of the United States land service or something like that. I mean, we're going to need to use a lot of land to put all these solar farms and wind farm. So, I mean, I have to imagine maybe regenerative agriculture, you know, I have to imagine that um, the need for land and the value of land just through that lens is going to really, uh, you know, the value is really going to increase as well. I, I, yeah, I completely, I completely agree. Like there's that big push to turn the grid into hundred percent renewable energy by 2035. And if they're going to do that, uh, they're, they're going to need all the space and the land and everything like that. So I think that's like, to me, that's, that's kind of an area I wanted to like progress into. I like I still want to buy and sell properties and everything like that, but I'd like to have some longer term projects that we set aside and n no different than kind of doing a long term like housing development, getting that, getting that, you know, subdivision approved or something like that. Like you could do the same thing, hire an engineer to uh, get a solar farm approved on a, on a property, you know, and then obviously that's a, that's a home run type type deal um, once you can get something like that that approved it might be three years down the road or something like that but but uh i think working on some of those longer term projects would be great you know uh it's it's interesting go ahead i, I just wonder where where is the information about how to do that now like it, it has this has that come to the solar solo entrepreneur level yet or is it still it's crazy no there's there's not much stuff out there i've been trying to find good information sources about that you know, I think I think the real key uh, with something like that would be, I think, where to start would be to simply uh, call up engineering firms that kind of focus on developing solar farms and kind of, you know, see what it would cost to hire them, see what it would cost to to kind of get go down that road, and then, you know, you probably don't have to pay them completely up front. It could be something that you're you know, paying them in milestones as they, they go for those approvals and stuff, but they probably got this whole system worked out. And I would imagine, I would imagine after you go through the process, uh, a one time, you'd probably learn quite a bit, you know, you maybe figure out how to do it a little bit better next time and maybe a little bit cheaper, or maybe, maybe just hire someone internally in your company instead of hiring an outside engineering firm or something like that. So I think there's probably ways to make it more efficient over time. But but in reality, any of us, most any of us, I think, would, would need to re retain an engineer, uh, you know, to, to actually get it done anyhow. So that to me, I think is going to be my first step is trying to trying to find some some engineering firms that that have direct knowledge of that and have done this type of thing before. And that's what they specialize in. And then kind of have me walk, walk me through it. You know, obviously I'm going to be paying the bills, their bills as, as we go, but I think that's the way to get it done. So like if I was going to do a housing development, it would be the same thing. Really. It's not like I would be doing any of this stuff. I would just be trying to find the people that know how to do the stuff and then hire them. Yeah. So, you know, at some level it's, it's all the same and it all goes to outsourcing and finding the people with the, information yeah yeah it's it's interesting there's a, a good book that i listened to lately which is called um who not how and sometimes we get caught up in like wanting to do everything and learn how to do everything ourselves but then you know you, you lose track of the fact that some people are just experts in certain areas and things and you've got your things that you're already doing and stuff and, it, and most times it's better to just find the person that knows how to do that you know and and work with them to get things done. So that's what I'm trying to keep in mind. Absolutely. <laughs> that's such a great book. And the sequel, or one of its sequels is uh, 10X is, is easier than 
two X, I think. And yeah, very good as well. Yeah. Too, not a lot of people talk about that, but I think it resonates as well. Great stuff. Yeah. It's like, it's like, um, bigger picture ways of thinking, you know, like than than most entrepreneurs do, you know, we kind of get lost in kind of the day to day and just doing what we're doing and everything like that. But taking a step back to look at things like bigger picture, I think is really important. I think those books do a great job of that. So I, I love those. I listen to those books, each of those like two or three times each. So I have to do that because I miss so much stuff when I do it the first time and forget stuff. So I have to listen to it over and over again. <laughs> I think I'm due. I think I'm due for a reread as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I really appreciate your guys' time today. It's an awesome conversation. I was like, oh, we'll do like uh, 20 minutes or so. And here we go. We're at like 40, 46 minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I really appreciate your guys' time. And um, it was great working with you on this deal. And I would love to work with you guys on many, many more. I know you've got your own, you fund a lot of your own stuff as well, but Anytime you need a partner, want to do some bigger deals or anything like that, you know, please send them my way. And as as long as as long as uh, it's a deal, we will we will do it. Absolutely. So. Thanks so much for having us. Your your community is second to none. Uh, we've really really gotten a lot from it, and yeah, it's been a pleasure working with you. And uh, there'll be more for sure. Sounds great to me. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Pete. Alrighty.